problem with that they have a misconception of the nature and they got the wrong information. The bad thing, the elephants of nowadays, the uh, tusks are very small. Maybe they know if they uh, can be big, they can be hunted. <laughs> Every outfitter must help the community around the hunting block. You can help them by building a school, making a road, help them with the water. They have to read deeply and listen to people on the ground like us who are working in that sector so that you can tell them the truth. Mimi naitwa Lilian Tamremi, natokea Tanzania, nafanya kazi kama askari wa wanyamapori, rungwa hifadhi ya wanyama ya rungwa manyoni tanzania my name is lilian remy i'm from tanzania i'm working as a game scout in rungwa game reserves working under tau tanzania wildlife authority under the ministry of natural resources and tourism put down your latte and pull on your boots you and I and everybody listening to this owns 640 million acres. I think he killed more deer drinking his coffee, smoking his cigarette in the pickup truck than I did spending all that time freezing my butt off. Something that I would hope is that people realize that those are wild animals and they have savage natures. I look forward to packing animals out. I look forward to that pain of success. Doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you live. I've said it before and you know what I'll Say it again louder for the people in the back. Your present circumstance should not limit your passions. This is Jay Scott of the Jay Scott Outdoors podcast. Hey, this is Ryan Callahan. Hi, this is Jules McQueen. Hey, everybody. Jason Carter here with Epic Outdoors. Hey, guys, this is Tim Burnett with Solo Hunter. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey, y'all. Welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative, brought to you as part of the Waypoint Podcast Network. Y'all, I'm super excited. You may have listened to my episode with Sue Tidwell, author of Cries in the Savannah. And uh, if you listen to that or if you've read Sue's book, you, of course, know all about my next guest, uh, who Sue could not say enough about. I'm really glad Sue uh, was able to introduce us. So uh, on the call today, I have Lillian Remy all the way over from Tanzania. I think this is officially one of the longest distance podcasts i've i've had a chance to uh to record lillian i'm very excited to have you on thank you so much for joining me thank you sam so lillian i would love it if you could just introduce my listeners to yourself a little bit tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do but then also how did you get introduced to this work you're doing with wildlife in tanzania well I developed a passion to work as a wildlife friend, a game scout, when I was a little younger. And I was in standard three. I think I was about 10 years old. My uncle was a, working as a wildlife commander in a zone of antiquated commander in Arusha region within Tanzania. And when he came home in, during the holidays, most of the time we used to chat with him and he talked a lot of wildlife animals, his trips to here and there within the parks, camp reserves. And I find myself, I developed the passion to be part of that. So I told myself that when I finish my education, I want to study more about wildlife. I want to engage myself to maybe if I'm not to be a ranger or I will be a tour guide. So after my, my secondary education, I went direct to the college. My college name is Mwenka Wildlife College uh, in Kilimanjaro. And so I started to study a technician certificate there and my journey started there. That's fantastic. So uh, you said it was your uncle? Yes, my uncle. Your uncle, and he was a wildlife commander. So what <laughs> what does a wildlife commander do? Uh, it was, by the time the, his rank, he was a Zono and Fortune commander. Zono, it considers, contains about three regions, Kilimanjaro, Arusha, and Manyara region. So the head who maintained, who supervised the whole region, his name was uh, Zono and Fortune commander. Okay. And so uh, so you went to school to learn about wildlife. You had this 
passion for wildlife growing up from the time you were from the time you were 10. What then took you from getting your education to what you're doing now? Uh, after completing my education, I got employed by the government directly to work in Rumba Game Reserve as a game scout. Yeah, it was 2014 till today. Okay. And so what do your duties as, as a game scout include? What are your responsibilities in this role? Uh, a game scout has a lot of responsibilities, including the to supervise tourism hunting, uh, to do conducting uh, anti poaching patrols, to monitor and coordinate uh, the ecosystem at large, to supervise the early burning of the vegetation, even to, to be a tour guide, also this is a part of the game scout. Um, a lot in, in the office, we do such things such as finance also, administration sometimes. So it sounds like, I mean, you do a little bit of everything out there. You you do hunting work, you do biology, you do, you probably tell people about the history of the region and the animals and you it sounds like you kind of do the job of about six different people in one. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. So you talk about guiding um, tourism hunts on the, the game reserve. And I know for people in a lot of people in America and a lot of people in Europe, the talk about hunting in Africa is a very sensitive, touchy kind of subject. You get a lot of people that get, very angry <laughs> about exactly. about hunting animals in Africa and what you know say somebody gets on Instagram or Facebook and they see a picture of of someone that's maybe done one of these hunts over in Tanzania and they start ranting and raving and and yelling about how horrible this is and how we're destroying wildlife and it's terrible to kill these beautiful animals how would you kind of respond to someone like that I think uh, the problem with that is they have a misconceptions of the nature and they got the wrong information. But if they know the reality and how the hunting is conducted, I think they will get into the point and they will accept it. So when you say uh, say the reality of, of how everything's connected, mm -hmm. what would you say that reality is? You know, a lot of people think that hunting, maybe you just go to the bush and hunt everything you see in front of you. Well, that is not true. Uh, we follow and consider the rules and regulations uh, and it's done in scientific because you can't hunt without taking the research of the number or the required quota. Set the quota doing conducted by the researchers themselves. So the expert uh, mentioned out uh, how many animals to be hunted in the in particular year. So maybe the population of wild beasts exceed the number in the given area. So the number exceeded the, is going better to hunt to reduce instead to bring other problems. So uh, hunting is conducted scientifically, not just to hunt every animal. And the, the researchers provide the, they set a quota, a hunting quota every year. That helps to follow and cope with the situation. So you said that, say, wildebeests or other animals, if they're over quota, they can cause problems. What are some of the problems that you see when these animals are, are over quota, when it's uh, too populated? Uh, overpopulation of animals is a problem because if they overpopulated, they may lack food, enough food, and they will become weak and they, they may destroy the habitat. You know, the animals are a lot and they depend on each other. So if the habitat is going to be, de to be destructed, it's also a problem. And what is the attitude of, because I know, um, I know there's probably over there, there's a lot of varying attitudes from the local communities towards these animals. What do you see generally as the, the attitude from the communities when it comes to these animals? Uh, we have a problem with the 
animals to destroy habitats and to destroy the people's properties, farms, especially elephants uh, or lions to eat uh, livestock. But we just to talk to them, to educate them. And sometimes the government do compensate. They compensate. Uh, they you say to compensate or to promote and to teach them how to live with them. Uh, most of the national parks, the organ reserves, people are the ones who follow the and build houses adjacent to protected area. That's the problem, the main problem. But we teach a lot of methods to help them to avoid a huge or massive encroachment, like to teach the local communities to put some barriers, maybe like to plant unpalatable species adjacent to protected areas that will not attract animals to enter into their farms or into their houses. Uh, especially the people that can plant sisal. Sisal is unpalatable species for animals to eat. So if maybe the elephant came and find there's no food in the in the adjacent of the protected area, it's much more they can go back to the protected area. Um, other we teach the methods like to use chili, the paper. Uh, they dry chili and blend it, put it in the clothes and just to, to hang it around their houses or around their farm. It chili makes the animals to irritate. They irritate their nose, so they go back to the park. Sometimes uh, when the elephant, uh, they come in a, in a big group and when a big herd, and invade maybe the uh, local community, they arrange themselves and use the drums to beat the drums. Elephants, by nature, they hate big noises. Really? So, yes. Huh. yes they hate. So they beat the drums, they make them to go back to the park. That's, that's interesting because, you know, over here we have grizzly bears, we have moose, we have, we have some pretty big animals. And you know, if one gets into a house, it can do some damage and they definitely damage people's crops and livestock. But I can't imagine an elephant coming into my front yard. <laughs> and that, yeah. it's, I just it's I like I can't program. even fathom something that big, you know, like it's walking, really walking through my back field and just destroying everything <laughs> in its path. <laughs> Yes, a lot of, we teach them method even to hang the beehives. Bee, the bees tend to make the elephant to go back to the park. So when you hang the beehives around your farm, it's one of the methods to make them to not enter into their farm. Oh wow. That's in and, and I'm sure you guys have some some pretty big scary bees over there. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think people over here in, in America and in a lot of the, the European countries, they have this, this feeling that it's like this, this perfect relationship between humans and animals over there. And there's, you know, this beautiful balance and all of the, all of the local people there just love and treasure these animals and but I mean, as we're talking, when you have an elephant walking through your backyard and you live and die by those crops that you have growing or whatever that happens to be, you would probably rather that elephant didn't be there. It's And I think it's amazing that you you guys work with the local communities to learn to live with those animals and to deter them from their, you know, whether it's like you said, through the chili or building, uh, planting those unpalatable plants or hanging <laughs> hanging beehives. That's, I think, my... The beehives, I think, are my favorite idea, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you're going to harvest honey also. So you're going to make money through selling the honey. Mm -hmm. That's a, I didn't even I didn't even think about that. It's it has all kinds of benefits. Yes. So uh, do you have do you see a lot of a lot of issues with poaching surrounding that as far as whether it's it's 
locals wanting the meat. And so they kill the animals for that or just eliminating the animals that are coming onto their property and, and killing their animals or, or trampling their crops. Uh, fortunately, uh, at the moment, I can say, I can admit it, it's reduced a little bit. Uh, we encounter the small poaching, like uh, people entering the park to have a honey, uh, timber for timber, and just for the big mammals, like the poachers who poach for elephant tusks, uh, that very reduced nowadays. We are very few to encounter. Uh, uh, local communities for bushmeat is still there, uh, but for the numbers, it's very reduced. So, for those listening that don't understand, what uh, how would you define bushmeat? All right, bushmeat. Uh, the meat come from the wild animals. So it's it's pretty much any any meat that someone kind of poaches from the wild animals that they're not supposed to be taking then. Yes, it's, it's a bush meat. It's any meat from the poacher uh, harvested any animal from the protected area. Uh, but if it's harvested in, in a regulated manner, it's also a bush meat. But the one sell in the villages by the poachers, that is a mistake. So it's, they sell bush meat, but by mistakes. They make mistakes. Okay. Um, what What's the the health of the animal populations like in Tanzania? I mean, do you see lately as the poaching has been down, going down, as you were saying, you know, you still have, have tourists coming in and hunting and what are some of the game animals that say tourists are allowed to come in and hunt in Tanzania? The animals that are not allowed or that are allowed? Uh, well, let's start. Uh, what animals are not allowed? Uh, at the moment, uh, they stop to hunt elephants because they say the task nowadays they're very reduced. So they ban to hunt elephant. But lately they allow it, but make sure the tasks are really big, really big. And the bad thing, the elephants of nowadays, the uh, tasks are reduced. Maybe they know if they uh, can be big, they can be hunted. <laughs> <laughs> so their tasks are very small. Well, naturally, they become small. So I don't see a lot of clients came, they don't hunt elephant. But uh, in Tanzania, it's strictly prohibited to hunt a giraffe. A giraffe is our national animal. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not allowed to hunt a giraffe, but uh, other animals is allowed to hunt them. So with the elephants, um, I think that's a really interesting point about the tusks is if you're approved to hunt an elephant, you have to you you need to hunt one with the longer tusks, yes. which I assume means it's an probably an older, more established animal, correct? Yes, yes. So did you see just a lot of people were coming in, maybe shooting the first elephant they saw and a lot of younger ones were being taken. So the the population wasn't renewing itself like it normally would. I think because uh, in uh, previous years, the elephant poaching was very high. So its number okay. was highly, very reduced. I think the government and uh, international community, maybe they just set that regulation maybe to make them regain their population again. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, somebody that wants to come over for a trip, they can come over and, and I'm not, I'm not sure what all animals are in the Tanzania area, but they could come over and hunt a a Cape Buffalo or a a lion, a warthog, a A heart beast. Yes. A heart beast. Uh, Uh, What are some of maybe the, your favorite, hunt experiences that you've been on? Oh, my friend. Uh, I think the my guest, the client Sue and Rick in 2014 was my favorite. It was my first trip when it was my favorite because even the clients were very friendly mm-hmm. and uh, I just enjoy every point. And the 
most excited point is Sue. Sue was my friend, <laughs> become, become friend with me <laughs> the first day. And Sue was trying to learn Swahili. And when Really? She, she didn't mention yes, that. <laughs> yes, she was trying to learn Swahili. And when she pronounces the words, I was <laughs> laughing all the time because... <laughs> Because you, you can tell the name, the, to mention something here, and after two hours, you're going to pronounce it vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> it's become, it make me to laugh all the time. <laughs> it was very excited. Uh, that's a, that trip was very the best for me. So now I'm curious. Uh, say, for example, your name. How would... How would your name be pronounced in Swahili? Would it just be Lillian or is there like a Swahili pronunciation of it? No, it's just Lillian. Swahili, okay. Swahili is Lillian. Yeah. I might, I might have to, uh, I might have to get you to teach me like one small little phrase or something that I can, that I can use, but. Uh, I can teach you to say thank you. Uh, thank you very much. In Swahili, you can say Asante Sana. Asante Sana. Exactly. Okay, that much I actually know from watching The Lion King as a kid. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I I I didn't realize I knew that until just now, but I had no idea what it meant. But oh. I <laughs> I learned that from a Disney movie, apparently. Okay, that's great. Asante Sana. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to remember that for the end of the podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, in, in America and Europe right now, or I should say, let me, let me ask first, um, other than reducing the, the overpopulated animals, what are some of the benefits you see to the local communities when, when people come in hunting from overseas? All right. Apart from the general benefit that the government uh, get the revenue, collect the revenue from the hunting, uh, I can say that, uh, especially in Tanzania, the Ministry of Natural Resources were, were seated with the outfitters, the hunting outfitters, and they were planning, they were agreed to help the, every outfitter must help the community around the hunting block. Uh, you can help them by building a school, uh, making a road, help them with the uh, water, um, and to help them with the maybe school uniforms. So each year when you start the hunting season, you have to make sure you do a, a small thing, I can say a small thing in a community and report to the ministry. That's the one that was the benefit. Another benefit, uh, a lot of local communities have been employed. Just this um, manual work uh, with the hand guys, a lot of them get the employment in the outfitters company. That's a huge benefit. Apart from them to take the bush meat to the family after the hunter, <laughs> <laughs> get the hunt after the hunting. Uh, season finished, they took the meat to the uh, village. So the local community also have to test their animals. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think, you know, a lot of people over here, you know, know that, okay, somebody hunts an animal and then the community, the local communities tend to get the meat. And that's, mm. that's a pretty big deal already. I mean, you know, I'm assuming except for, except for bush meat and maybe a little bit of, little bit of cattle that's being raised mm -hmm. there's not a ton of of meat that's that's in the diet of some of these communities if would that would that be right yes it's a, a great source of protein for the local community and that's just just to show them the 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 love it's not just the, the must no just to show love for, to them but I didn't I don't think a lot of people realize that uh what you're talking about the requirement for the outfitters to provide value to the communities. I think that is, that is huge. Yes, a lot of, it's, it's huge. And a lot of people does, they don't are aware of that. So when we talk, when I talk about it, most of the time we have to make them know. That's, uh, I mean, this is, 
first time I've ever even heard about it. And I, I talk with a lot of people about hunting in Africa and the benefits. And I thought I was pretty well informed and educated about it, but I guess I'm still learning new things every day. Exactly. And you know, another point you bring up, uh, employment for a lot of the local communities. Exactly. You know, there's, uh, I was talking with Sue and we were kind of talking about what's involved when it comes to setting up a mm-hmm. hunting camp. And it's not just, you know, here in North America, kind of when a lot of us go hunting, we go off by ourselves or with a friend maybe, and we take a tent and a backpack, or maybe we just take our car in and, you know, drive out and then go back to a hotel for the day. Our hunting camps, you know, even if they're really complicated, it's just a really big tent. You know, there's Mm -hmm. not really much to it. Setting up a hunting camp over there is a little bit different, right? It's different, very, very different and costful and well prepared, well managed. I think because it's very remote area and it has a lot of dangers, animals, predators. So that makes people to well prepared and it's a business. So you have to satisfy your client. Mm -hmm. Mm. So during a hunting season, how many people would you say, uh, just an estimate, how many people would you say are involved when it comes to maybe just one hunting camp, like setting up the hunting camp, running it through the season and then tearing it down at the end of the season? Uh, It depends with the, a type of uh, outfitter and how many clients he receive in a particular time. So I can say maybe for a one client can be having a, a crew of about 20 members, 20 years uh, from the cook, a tent boy, a laundry boy, the skinner, the camp manager, radio operator, drivers. So it's a lot of people. And that's just for for like one camp, one client. And in Tanzania alone, how many outfitters would you say there are? Oh, I don't know the exact number, but there are a lot. I can't tell the number exactly for today because uh, we have uh, a lot of game reserves and in each game reserve, they have their own outfitters, different outfitters. So I can tell the exact number of the whole, whole of outfitters. I mean, would you say more than 10, more than 20? Uh, uh, more, I think more than 30. More than 30. So, I mean, <laughs> there's at least on a small scale, I mean, just hunting for one season is employing over six to 700 people. Uh, I can say one outfitter is me because they are the same person who uh, working for every client. I can say in a, one outfitter can employ up to 150, 150 person oh, wow. in your season. So, I mean, then we're talking yeah. at least, I mean, that's, that's almost 5,000 people. <laughs> I bet. Exactly. That of, is. Yeah, I didn't. Exactly. I didn't. I just. I didn't realize the scale. Yeah, it's very big. So, what is it like? You know, it's it's again. You know, we have some dangerous animals out here in in North America. We deal with with grizzly bears, but I feel like it's a little less remote. Even when we're really remote here, you know, it's 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 less remote than it it would be being out in the bush in Tanzania. What's it like just it being out there surrounded by, um, you know, Sue talks about you're laying there and you're just like, you're listening to lions roaring in the middle of the night. And, and all you have is this little piece of cloth with, mm. between you and them. Uh, I can say I can, it's a precious moment for me. I like to be in the bush when you have all the necessary needs. It's a great moment. It's a very nice moment. I like to hear the birds singing, uh, the lion roars. I like it. I love it. Uh, the only and uh, the only creature I'm afraid of is the snake. I'm Oof. afraid of the snakes. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. you and me both. I, <laughs> my listeners have heard me say this before. I'm sure, but. Mm. I'm not terrified of a lot of things. Mm. You know, there's things that I'm I'm careful around, but 
snakes just scare the snot out of me. <laughs> they terrify me. <laughs> yes, I can so I can make you a lion, but I won't be bad as much as when you saw a snake. And you remember in, in Africa, we have a very dangerous snakes. Especially in the Rumba Game we have the all dangerous snakes, the vipers, black mamba, green mamba, oh, and no the thing. cobras, all a lot of types of cobra. So it's very dangerous. <laughs> but we are surviving, we're enjoying the, the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like to some extent, a lot of things in Africa, like the bees, even. It's like we've got bees, but you guys have bees. <laughs> 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 You know, we've got we've got some venomous snakes, but you guys have a lot of venomous. <laughs> it's like, man. Exactly. <laughs> Every, whew, everything everything wants to wants to to bite you or your sting you, it seems like. Yes, they have scorpions. <laughs> oh, gee, I, I don't scorpions. <laughs> I'm not I'm not as terrified of them as snakes because I, I feel mm. like they, you know. I don't know. They're not as much of a surprise, but I still don't like the idea of them. I, I just really don't. <laughs> I've been bitten by a scorpion two times. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Yes, that's normal. <laughs> so, so what happens? Say you're you're out on a hunt and somebody gets bitten. Uh, say, for example, Sue and Sue and Rick's hunt. Say mm-hmm. somebody on that hunt got bitten by a venomous snake. <laughs> Oh, that's bad. God is, forbid. <laughs> I mean, is it is it pretty much, you know, they're just like, you hope for the best, like there's not much you can do? Or? Yeah, I hope for the best. No, no one will be treated. But uh, I, what I know, uh, a lot of outfitters, they have the, the antidote by themselves. Most of the time they have the outfitters. But the government, who, as you know, we don't have. <laughs> 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 so if uh, it's very dangerous snake, uh, it's, be, it's going to be a huge problem. But I think the outfitters they are good to they are well <clears throat> to help their clients immediately. So you know, so if you're lucky, they have the I guess the the anti venom there on the spot. But you know, on on average, one of these hunts, how far away are you from? a town or a hospital or a city, anything like that? Oh, it's very far. Uh, for, for example, where we were with, this, with Sue and Rick uh, to meet, to reach the hospital, the big hospital, which have the all facilities. It's about three fifty hundred kilometers. That's. It's very far. You're not, you're not going to be in very good shape if you get, yeah, exactly. if you get bitten by a snake or. <laughs> Um, exactly. mm-hmm. Have you have you ever seen anyone get seriously injured on one of these hunts? Or I only see once a, a lady from the village. Uh, it's called the tribe called Sukuma Land, uh, a very remote area. A lady was bitten by a black mamba, and I saw her die. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it was a terrible moment. Uh, I don't want oh, yeah. even to remember. We need to we need to talk about a different subject because this is yes, exactly. this is just giving me the the willies. I'm like I'm looking under my desk right now. I'm in my house and I'm looking under my desk right now. Are there any snakes around here? Uh, <laughs> so you know, again in in America and in, in Europe, there's a push from a lot of people to ban trophy imports. You know, be like, okay, well. You know, a lot of a lot of people over here that have probably never been to Africa and have honestly probably never stepped more than 10 feet away from a manicured front lawn. They they say, OK, well, hunting in Africa is bad, so we can't tell them what to do. We can't stop it, but we can prevent people from bringing these trophies back home with them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, somebody hunts a lion and they want to obviously bring their their lion home or whatever that happens to be Mm -hmm. what sort of effect do you think banning trophy hunting would have on the communities the local communities and just the the animals in in tanzania that's a bad idea and 
what I can say. Uh, maybe we can ask them to hear on the other side. If they are the politicians in, in America, or uh, the member of the parliament, maybe they can hear the member of parliament of Tanzania who said that the regulations and the laws that allow to hunt scientifically so that they can know in deep the really reality on the ground. Because if they, they decide by themselves and don't know the other side of the world, that would be very, very, very bad. I think they can, we can tell them to, to listen to us on the ground and to know the reality of it so that they can allow people to, to enjoy their trophy. That will be, be, be better. Because even the international communities, the organizations, they allow it by the regulations. They say if this is well regulated, they can allow it. So it's better to to uh, to allow people to have their trophy. So if you could say one final thing to to Americans, to any of my listeners about hunting in Africa, uh, if you if you wanted to leave them with with one thing one important thing, what would that be? Uh, I want them to know uh, hunting in Africa is a good thing and it helps a lot of people to maintain their life. It supports a lot of family people. A lot of people depend on that to survive. Uh, and it's done, scientific and well-managed. So they have to support it. Uh, they have to support they have to pay for to hunt. They have to purchase our souvenirs. They have to book for safari adventures. They have to wear our jewelries, our diamond, our tangerite, so that they can support people in Africa. And the hunting in Africa is not bad as they think. They have to read deeply and listen to people on the ground like us who are working in that sector so that you can tell them the truth. Uh, it is a procedure, well, well regulated procedure, and it's done scientifically. So they have to. We want to welcome them to come and to see and to view it by themselves. Fantastic. So, mm -hmm. if uh, say someone like myself was interested in taking their first trip to Africa, and after listening to this podcast, like you know what. I want to go hunt with Lillian in Tanzania. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is it is it possible to to come out and request you as a game scout, or how would somebody go about doing that? Uh, normally, it's not the client who is applying for a, a game scout. Uh, it work, it's normally the office who arrange. Uh, certain outfitters may ask for two rangers, maybe. So the office is the one who arrange. But in your special case, you have to tell your outfitters to ask in our office. I want to go with Lillian. <laughs> uh, can you go anywhere in Tanzania or is there a certain area that you particularly work? No, in in my working place, in my game reserve, which is Rungwa Game Reserve. Rungwa Game Reserve? Yes. Fantastic. Well, Lillian, I really appreciate you taking the time. You know, I did. It took us a, took us a little bit. We had power outages, and um, but I I really loved this conversation with you, and I appreciate you taking the time to hop on and share with my listeners. Thank you very much. I'm happy with me to be here. Thank you, and I'm humbled, and I appreciate it too. All right, y'all. That'll do it for this episode of the Wild Initiative. Y'all, I honestly. I have to say, this is probably my hands down favorite podcast I've ever recorded. Uh, and honestly, I would I would argue one of the most important podcasts I've ever recorded. So often we think we know what's best for other people, other communities. And it, it it's eye opening to talk with someone from that actual community and hear what they have to say when it comes to hunting and all of that really a, a big thank you to Lillian for taking the time out of her day to join me. I, I 
pretty sure that's the farthest podcast I've ever recorded. I mean, shoot, it's amazing that we have this technology, right? And again, a big thank you to Sue for uh, for introducing me to Lillian. Make sure you check out Sue's book, Cries of the Savannah. You can hear more stories about her and Rick's adventures out in Tanzania. But y'all, uh, make sure you head on over to iTunes or Stitcher. If you like what I'm doing, give the podcast a rating and review. It helps so much. It's like Christmas every time I get a new rating, y'all. Would love to get a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher um, or wherever you listen to the podcast or if they, if they allow you to do so. But y'all, that'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time. But until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from The Wild Initiative family, and more. 